Hello everyone, my name is Dondra. Welcome to the Rez Take. We've got a good show for you all today. I just want to remind everyone real quick that the NFL is releasing their schedule tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern. I'm looking forward to it, and tomorrow I'll come with my takeaways. So to start off, I want to start talking about um, some stuff in the past. So the segment's called Looking Into the Past. I want to talk about um, the NBA specifically, and the um, topic I want to talk about is which underdogs that won the NBA championship was like the biggest surprise. And there's a bunch of good candidates, a bunch of teams that were nice on the championship that I could choose from. But I went ahead and chose um, the 2011 Dallas Mavericks, and there's a bunch of reasons why. So to start off and recapping what they did, so they beat the Portland Trailblazers in the first round as expected. Um, Blazers were a decent team, but it was expected. And then they faced the Lakers in the second round, the Lakers had the home court advantage. So the Lakers at this time, they had just won back-to-back -back championships. And what did the Mavs do? They sweep the Lakers. It's not like it was a tough competition. They swept the Lakers. That right there is up to sweep the two-time defending champions when when they're one of when they're the best one of the best teams in the league still. That's pretty impressive. And what's interesting is that what this does is that at, is that once they sweep swept the Lakers, besides this past season because they had LeBron and the Lakers had never been the same since then. So that swept really really did a number on the Lakers. So it's pretty interesting when you think about that. But anyways, the late so the Mavericks sweep the Lakers annihilated them and then they faced the thunder in the western conference finals now i know the thunders were babies at the times kevin durant russell westbrook james Horner were all super young but nevertheless it's still a really good team and they were able to defeat the thunder in five games again that's pretty good and then when you go to the finals they faced the big three with their first year together and LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, and Chris Bosh. And I remember when that um, when that came out to be, everyone's like, oh, um, the Heat are going to win a sweep. Maybe go five games, but the Heat are basically going to sweep. What did the Mavs do? They win it in six games, including two wins in Miami. Now, when you looking back, you may feel like, well, um, they must have had a lot of super good guys, and it must have had a, must have had a really good team. Well, they had a good team, but they didn't really have a lot of super guys, if you will. They had just one All Star. Now, Jason Kidd's been an All Star, but like at that point, um, at that current time, they only had one All Star, which was, of course, Dirk Nowitzki. And then they had Jason Kidd, Jason Terry, um, Tyson Chandler, and Sean Marion as a as rounding up the starting five. So those are. It's not the best starting five. It's not world beaters, but the way it worked is because they're like the um, Detroit Pistons when they didn't really have a bunch of superstars. They just had a bunch of good players together coming together, knowing their roles and executing their roles. That's exactly what the Dallas Mavericks did. Jason Kidd knew to dish the ball, but then when he needed to make some clutch threes, Jason Terry knew he needed to get open to shoot wide open threes. Times to chill, though he needed to stuff the lane and make sure to get rebounds and block shots. Sean Marion knows to play defense and, and create looks for guys. So everyone knew their role. And then besides the starting five, it also helps to have the, be the exact bench players that you need to fulfill your roles. So they had Peja Stogiagovic making up the threes. J.J. Barrera was able to facilitate while Jason Kidd was on the bench. Brandon Hayward was able to do exactly what, a similar, like, do exactly what Tyson Chandler does, basically, able to spell him. They had Deshaun Stevenson and Karam Butler and Corey Brewer, all guys who can play defense and knock up wide open, knock down wide open shots. So they had all the right ingredients and pieces that they need, and they were able to make this magical run and win a championship. So this is why I feel like the Mavericks are um, the best underdogs to win a championship. Because let's face it, that season, the Heat was the favorite. Lakers, probably second favorite. We're all kind of expecting that finals matchup. If not, then the then the Spurs, um, Thunder, and and Pacers would have all gone next in line before the Mavericks. So it's not like they were the third choice. They were probably like the sixth choice. So that's why I feel like again that, that the Mavericks deserve the title, the best underdogs to win an NBA championship.
So now to, to move on, um, I'm going to talk about college football. So there's been another scenario that's been popping around, and it's a very interesting scenario. So the scenario is that some teams, like the, so the season can start on time in the fall, and some teams, um, depending on their state's um, rules and restrictions and stuff, they can play, but then some states may not be able to. I, for my, in my opinion, this is a very interesting scenario and when I sat and pondered about it, I discovered that this scenario actually could work. Now, it wouldn't be easy, but it could work. So let's say that, so there's 130 teams in college football. So let's say that 70 teams get the okay to play while the others don't. Well, 70 out of 130, that's a little more than half the college football teams. And therefore, that's enough teams to compete and, and have a lot of games with. I feel like it, I feel like it, can't, it could work. Now, I'll admit it would be weird. Like, but um, if the conference, if the conference is power five conference, they want to produce a champion, then they're gonna figure out a way to play it out the season. So, for example, if you, let's take the ACC for example. Now, Clemson will most likely be able to play, and then they can try to win a championship for that conference. But Syracuse, Syracuse in New York, New York has one of the worst states with the coronavirus, so they might they might not be able to play it in the fall season. So is the ACC really not going to play football and deny Clemson that chance to, to win a championship just because Syracuse, which is kind of an eh team, can, won't be able to play? I don't feel like that will happen. So I went ahead and dived through the Power 5 conferences um, and tried to see which teams – Either would be able to play, would be a, or on the bubble they could or couldn't, and then um, I added both of them together and see how many teams from each conference I could play. So to start off with the ACC, I feel like eleven teams in that conference, eleven out of the fourteen teams in that conference can play, which is pretty good. So in my opinion, I feel like Clemson, Louisville, Wake Forest, Florida State, NC State, Miami. North Carolina, Duke, Georgia Tech, Virginia, and Virginia Tech can play. Pittsburgh, um, I'm not sure. I feel like Pennsylvania in general would be pretty hard, but but I'm just not sure about the coronavirus cases if they can really pull through or not. Because if so, then you can count Pittsburgh in there. And then the other two are Boston College and Syracuse. I wouldn't think either of those would be able to play. Um, and then going to the Big 12, I think seven out of the 12 teams can play. So you got you got two Oklahoma and Oklahoma State. You got the two Kansases and Kansas and Kansas State. You got West Virginia. You got Iowa State. And then I only think one of the Texas teams would be able to compete, and that would be Texas Tech, since Lubbock is not as big of an area as Austin or Fort Worth or Waco. So I feel like Baylor, Texas, and TCU would miss the cut. But those seven teams would be able to play still. Although I know Texas is losing restrictions, but since those are big cities, that's why I'm kind of hesitant to put them in. And then for the Big Ten, yeah, I feel like you have eight teams, mostly in one division. But you have Nebraska, Purdue, Illinois, Iowa, Northwestern, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Indiana. So right now, I, I don't feel like the Michigans and Ohio's would be able to, and then and then Rutgers obviously would, and Maryland would be able to compete um, when it's all said and done. As Ohio, Michigan lose them. Sure. I don't think Maryland, especially Rutgers, I feel like they would miss out entirely. But eight teams there, it's going to – Big 12, the Pac-12, I mean, there's only six teams, so it's just half the conference. But, again, all you need is at least half. So the Pac-12, I have Utah, both the Arizona schools, Arizona State, Arizona. Then you got Colorado. And then you got Washington State because Washington State – Pullman's not a big area versus Washington, Seattle area where obviously that's a bad case for Congress. And then you got Oregon State, which, again, um, Oregon State area is not as big as Eugene, Oregon, or Portland, Oregon, stuff like that. So I feel like those six teams would be able to compete, and so that means none of the California teams would be able to, because California has a bad case of coronavirus. And then the SEC, I feel like actually 12 of the 14 teams, like most of the teams should be able to compete. So that'd be Georgia, Florida, Tennessee, Kentucky, Missouri, South Carolina, Vanderbilt, Alabama, Auburn, Mississippi State, Ole Miss, and Arkansas. So the only two schools that would miss the cut here would be Texas A&M and then the defending champions, LSU. So, I, again, I feel like this is – and, again, the LSU and Texas – because it's the SEC and they need to play, they might risk it, and they have all 14 teams play there. 
And then you got, of course, got the two main independents in Notre Dame and BYU. So you add that up, and that is a total of 46 teams. And then let's just say 30 of the group of five teams can be able to play. So then that's 76 teams out of 100. That's enough teams. That's enough to make some schedules and go off of. Now, again, schedule issues could be a ha- would be a, a very much of a hassle here. Like in this case, you may only be able to do conference games only, and if only a few independents could play, just figure out, just put one of those independents in the conference. So Notre Dame already has a partial schedule lines with the ACC, so you can just put Notre Dame with the ACC, and then since the Big 12 has a odd number of teams, you can just put BYU there to make it even type of thing. And then put like maybe New Mexico State with Conference USA or something like that. But yeah, so that's what you can do. Um, I th- it would be a, it would be a tough scheduling arrangements because uh, I mean of course you already have the normal schedule so to rearrange all that again would be a hassle, which is why again I feel like if you wait till the spring of 2021, to where uh, everything should be back to normal and all the teams will be able to play, then that's great. But if you're going to do this scenario, I don't blame the college football. I don't blame the conferences in college football, the NCAA, for doing this scenario. If they want, if they want to do it, um, it would be the it would be the worst thing in the world. Again, in this scenario, of also like this interest during the fall, that means fans probably would not be able to be in attendance. But again, it's football when well, we need sports again, so it'd be worth it. Uh, so before I go, also I want to wrap up with some other news as well. So tomorrow, the um, NBA Commissioner Adam Silver is going to be talking to everyone uh, on a phone call with everyone in the NBA. So it'll be interesting to see what breaking news comes out tomorrow as far as when um, teams can start going to facilities and start scrimmaging and, and then when we can eventually get the NBA season back together because I hope that's going to be soon. So for tomorrow's show, I'm going to be talking about my takeaways from the NFL schedule, talk about um, – I do another segment from Blast in the past, and then I'm gonna, and then eventually I'm gonna be able to next week give you my predictions of what's gonna happen with the NFL season since we know the schedule and stuff like that. All right, well, thank you very much. My show is getting a little bit early today. Please make sure to leave comments um, and let me know what you want to hear on the show. Thank you very much, and and you have you guys have you guys and everyone have a wonderful day. Stay safe from the coronavirus, and good luck. <laughs>